<laughs> we made the U-turn, by the way. For, we uh, did make the like U-turn. Show so. killed him? <laughs> <You're> so disappointed. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she's stopped in front of the box. Yeah, no, she's putting up a stop sign. Yeah, so we go. Fair enough. Fair enough. Alligators. Yeah. What can you do? Anyway, any other questions? I said I'd give you another shot of questions. Anything else? No? Yes, sir. The diner looked different on the inside because this was not the diner that they used. The interior was a set that was in California in Studio City. It was all filmed on a set. But that's like the establishing yeah. shot. Yes? Uh, they knocked out toms, right? Uh, yeah, you never saw toms Did you make us think about that? No, not at all. They signed a release to use it, but they just wanted it to remain generic, so they didn't call it toms, because it was called monks anyway on the show. Hey, I'm going to interrupt myself. When we come to the left-hand side of the bus here, we go through this intersection, the world's largest Gothic cathedral. Cathedral of St. John the Divine holds 12,000 people for church services. Give you an idea how big this church is. This oh. building on the corner is the men's room, okay? Oh my That's God. how big it is. Okay, wow. okay. We got to up here. It's, it's really worth seeing. If you go in there, it's open to the public. There's a dish you throw in a contribution. There's a museum in there. There's a gift shop in there. It is probably one of the most magnificent churches. You know. And you know, I, I was just in Italy. I was at, uh, you know, uh, in Rome the other day, and we were going through churches all over the place. But I'll tell you, this holds up as good as any church I saw in Italy. The Pope's a big Seinfeld. Yeah, the Pope is a big Seinfeld, and he wanted to meet me. But <laughs> I was busy that day. <laughs> Who's that guy with Kramer? Is that a joke? Goiter scene. Who's that guy with Kramer? <laughs> so anyway, listen, you know, I, was, I was telling you in the theater that uh, Larry never really had a chance to have a career as a stand-up comic because nobody would take a chance of putting him on television. You know, all the producers said, Larry David, the guy's a genius, but I just can't take a chance of putting him on my show and having him wipe out my audience for the night is just not worth it. So the fact that Larry didn't get any shots doing stand-up on TV is the reason Larry didn't get booked into comedy clubs that were opening up all across America. Because, you know, Cincinnati, Ohio, if they put your name up and no one's ever heard of you, you're not doing business. So, you know, and so that's why Larry, you know, because his wildest dream, like, you know, when he was living across the hall from me in the beginning there, or when he was in the building, if he could have just made 60, 75 grand a year doing stand-up, he would have fulfilled his, his you know, that was his fantasy. Today, he? I mean, but, yeah, he could do anything he wants today. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, he never had that opportunity because his act was so, you know, it, it, was, uh, it, was, just, it was hit or miss, you know. If it was ugly, it would really be ugly, yes. Yeah. Is there any tape of Larry David? Is there any tape of Larry David doing stand-up? Funny you should mention that because I'm about to show it to you. Oh! Yes. This goes back to 1984. The only time he ever did stand-up comedy on television came about because a friend of ours named Richard Belzer, who you all know as Detective Munch on television. Yeah. Well, in the early days of cable and the Lifetime Network, Belzer had his own show called Hot Properties. And he kept bugging Larry, come on, do my show, do my show. And Larry kept telling him, I'm too busy writing for Saturday Night Live, I don't have time, which was really an excuse. Larry was afraid to do Belzer's show because it was live television, not live to tape, but live. And if he bombed, it would go out there, everybody would see it, so he was scared to do it. But when Saturday Night Live went on hiatus, Belzer stayed right on the case. Well, come on, Larry, you know, there's no Saturday Night Live now, you're on hiatus, let's go, you know, come. So Larry reluctantly agrees to do the show. Now, the day of the show, Larry was like so frightened. He was like a guy going to the electric chair. I cram, I got diarrhea, I can't do it. I'm pissing every 10 minutes. I, I'm telling you, I can't do this show. So I said, of course you can do it. And I went with him to the station, you know, to kind of keep him cooled out. And I'll never forget, I was standing at the elevator. I said, you know, Larry, I forgot to set the VCR to tape it. He said, oh, they'll give us a copy. I said, no, no, let me go tape it. So I went back, I reset my VCR, and I taped the show, and I'm glad I did. Because when I started the tour, I called up Belzer to see if I could get a copy of that show, right, from the master, rather than the copy I taped over the air. He told me the Lifetime Network mistakenly erased all of his shows. Oh, no. We're on so I have my, right what now. might be one of the only and copies in existence of Street. Larry David's only appearance doing stand-up comedy on television. This goes back Street. to 1984. We got it. <laughs> Oh, I have a nice round of applause yeah. for Larry oh, David, yeah, comedian. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Very funny guy. Because he asks me about this from time to time. Graham, how's the tour going? Good. Do you still show the masturbation video? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, why do you ask? Well, when you show it, do the people there? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are you kidding, Larry? They, yeah, they funny. applaud every time they see it. So, very so uh, you got to recognize a few lines there that line treating my body as an oh, amusement oh, park, yeah. which was a euphemism for the episode of the contest. Yeah. which was based on a real contest. I wasn't in it because I knew I'd never win it, but uh, Larry actually won the contest. 
in the third week, and it was a rough week, but I was at my house craving this contest. I, I've never been like this. I, I caught myself in the street staring at a horse's ass. <laughs> <laughs> also, you got your first glimpse of Larry's mother, and she reminded you of Estelle Costanza, because Larry's mother is the basis for Estelle. Larry's dad's name is Morty. Morty David is the basis for Morty Seinfeld. Morty David's retired, lives in Lauderdale, where he's the president of a condominium association. <laughs> Morty used to manufacture raincoats. That's what he did for a living, so <laughs> all that is there. You know, when I started this tour, it became very popular very quickly. One of the things I haven't done, if you'll notice, I haven't shown you any clips from Seinfeld. And I could have done this tour in such a way where I tell you what happened in real life and then throw on the clip and show you how it ended up in Seinfeld. But by not using clips from Seinfeld, what I've done here is to create my own intellectual property. You see, if I had, if I used clips from Seinfeld, and I could have used clips from Seinfeld, then I would have had to license them and go through all these clearances and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so it was just a big hassle, and I decided I'm better off just doing my own thing here. Uh, you know, I mean, Larry and Jerry, my friends, they support me doing this tour, but as far as NBC or Castle Rock are concerned, I licensed them the rights to base a character on me, and I had the presence of mind to insist that my license to them be on a non-exclusive basis in which I retained all the rights to my life story and character to promote in any and all media throughout the universe. That's the legal terminology, but basically I'm the only guy on the planet that could be doing a Seinfeld tour and not get a cease and desist order, so that's why I don't show clips from Seinfeld. Having said that, I'm about to show you a clip from Seinfeld. <laughs> and if anyone wants to sue, I'm sure Judge Judy would be thrilled to hear the case. Because I don't know if you know it or not, I'm in with Judge Judy. Anyway, just to set up this clip, uh, as you know, this tour is now, it's actually, I'm just finishing my 10th year of doing this. Can you imagine that? I mean, the show only ran for nine seasons. And it's been off the air for eight, and I'm running for ten years, <laughs> so it's pretty ridiculous. But uh, uh, the tour, as you know, it's, uh, it's 37.50, it's three hours long. Today we're going to be about 3.10. But, uh, and the first few years we did the tour, at the end of the tour, I used to bring everybody back to my building where there was a restaurant in the building and everybody would get original Kramer's famous pizza with a beverage and a surprise dessert, which was a frozen Snickers bar with a knife and fork. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the restaurant in the building went out of business and the pizza was always cold anyway and the tour was becoming more than four hours long so we just kind of eliminated the pizza. But uh, anyway, that being said, the clip I'm about to show you has to do with Elaine's boss. Jay Peterman, who's based, as you all know, on a real guy named Jay Peterman. Now, on the show, Jay Peterman decided he wanted to publish his autobiography. But as it turns out, his life was so boring that he couldn't find a publisher willing to take the book. So to spice the book up, what he did was he bought stories from Kramer. All these anecdotal stories that happened to Kramer, Peterman puts them in the book as though these are his stories. Yeah, 58, take a look. So he puts them in the book, Peter puts all these stories in the book as though these are his stories, and the book comes out and becomes a big bestseller. And now Peterman has become a celebrity based on the panache of all of Kramer's adventures. So Kramer, upon realizing Peterman is a now a celebrity based on his life, Kramer decides he's got to cash in on this. In case you missed it, this is the way it happened. So there we have it. It's uh, art imitates life, imitating life, imitating art, imitating life, or something like that. But that was a spoof of this tour. People have asked me if I got the idea to start a tour after I saw that episode of Seinfeld. And no, this tour started three years before that episode. So it was written by one of my favorite writers on the Seinfeld staff. It was a guy named Spike Pearson, who has his own show now on, uh, on Fox. Anybody see Spike's show yet? Is it any good? He's a good guy. He's a very funny guy. Uh, he, he is, he is a, a very talented writer. Um, in fact, he was one of the creators of the Michael Richards show who quit when he realized what a bomb it was going to be. <laughs> but, uh, but he's a really good guy. And he wrote probably one of the most famous episodes of Seinfeld. Yeah, you know, people always ask me what my favorite episode is. I have a couple of favorite episodes. It's hard to make a top ten list because then you see an episode, wait, that belongs up there. But uh, unequivocally, I give number one to the contest. You know, where the cast makes a bet who goes along and starts treating the bodies as amusement park. I mean, the fact that Larry got a show like that on prime time network television is really in the annals of the history of television comedy. You know, where a cast makes a bet who goes along with without masturbating, never using that word. It was just hilarious. Number two of all time popular Seinfeld episodes, I would guess, would have to go to Soup Nazi. And uh, Spike wrote that episode called The Soup Nazi. And speaking of which, we're about to pull into the place that was the inspiration for the Soup Nazi episode. Oh this is the place that Al Yaganov, known as the Soup Nazi, is the soup chef, he had this little business going here, and Spike, who used to work for Letterman, used to come here with the writers from Letterman for lunch. 
And when Seinfeld was in production, uh, they used to have these, you know, writer conferences that Larry would have where writers would pitch ideas for episodes. Yeah. And when Spike pitched the idea about this soup shop on 55th Street, pull up to the, to the uh, white line there so people can see. Uh, Larry said, let's film it. Now, I'll give you an idea what a nut this guy is. If you look at the side of his sign, you see the picture he chose to put of himself up there? He has the eyes of a homicidal maniac. You know that? So, but of course, Seinfeld, they did the show and they aired it. Naturally, the NBC Castle Rock has this disclaimer that says all characters and events are fictitious and any resemblance to characters living or dead are purely coincidental. Well, anyone who ever got soup at this place and then saw that episode of Seinfeld realized there is no way in hell this could be a coincidence. There can't be two eccentric soup guys like this on the same planet. Word got out there really is a soup Nazi. People started flocking here from all over the world. When he was open, the line went from here to the corner and all the way down the block. People would stand on line for an hour, hour and a half for the thrill of having them scowl as usual. Fork over 15 bucks for an eight ounce cup of biscuits. <laughs> yeah, it was really pricey stuff. The only soup shop with a loan officer, but uh, it's really good soup. So anyway, uh, Al uh, teamed up with this guy who owned the Sobe Beverage Company and sold it to PepsiCo for hundreds of millions of dollars. And now they have this uh, franchise called Original Soup Man Soup. Uh, there is one of the locations on Fifth Avenue uh, on the uh, just off Fifth Avenue on 42nd Street on the east side of the street, on the uh, southeast side of the street, a couple of doors in. There's a, and, and I've had the soups at these franchises. They are the same soups. They're delicious. Uh, but it's kind of rough for these franchises because without him as a personality, basically it's good soup, but it's very expensive soup. 15 bucks for a mm. cup of soup, you know. But it does come with bread and fruit <laughs> and, and all that. Yeah, you, get a, you get a bunch of stuff with it. It's a whole meal. Yeah. Well, and I have a little treat for you guys. As, as you know, for those of you, how many people bought Seinfeld DVDs? Yes? Cool. Yeah. And now season seven hasn't come out yet, has it? It's going to come out any minute. Yeah. Uh, usually they send me one when, as soon as it comes out, and I haven't gotten mine yet. In Australia, it came out a couple of days ago. Um, and, you know, for those of you who know, I did some bonus footage for the uh, DVDs. And one of the things I did was I came up here and I interviewed him on camera. And uh, the site of the, uh, the Soup Nazi episode is the seventh season. So if they're going to use the interview I did with him, it'll probably be in the next Seinfeld DVD box that comes out. But what happened was that uh, after I filmed it, the people over at Castle Rock were nice enough to send me all the raw footage of the stuff I did for them. And so I edited it together, my own little interview with him. I had to subtitle it because he's Turkish and he's kind of hard to understand, but I think you'll get the drift. So here now a little treat for you, a preview. Oh. what might be in the next DVD box, uh, an opportunity to meet the real soup Nazi, Al Yagana. So here he is. This is Al Yagana, America's most well-known soup chef. Not just New York's most well-known soup chef, but the world's most well-known soup chef. I've been here for a number of years, and the soup is incredible. Greatest soup on the planet. Maybe we can get out to say a few words for it. Now, of all the soups, do you have a favorite? No, a small goulash. You have to come up on this side, hand him your money, and then move to the left. That's the way it's done. That way he keeps the line moving. Everybody gets this soup quickly, and if you play it right and figure out what you want before you order, you'll get some extra surprises in your head. You gotta get one of your giving them this. Get a chance. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Now, you know, fans all over the world have been watching this thing. Do you have any comments you want to say to uh, people who watch Seinfeld?
<laughs> oh, no so refunds. as you can see, he's not a very happy camper. <laughs> no refunds. You ever look at his website? Seinfeld, yeah, Seinfeld ruined his life. Uh, this, this guy had a decent business before Seinfeld, but after Seinfeld, forget about it. I mean, he's at a line of 150 people mm -hmm. waiting to get soup. He's doing 30 grand a day cash in that little dump oh. when you know keep in mind the number one ingredient in soup is water <laughs> and, uh, you know so Seinfeld ruined his life he's, uh, <laughs> he's quite a character but anyway I gotta give him credit for good soup but he was open you know he, he also he begot a whole new breed of Nazis because when I was in the island of Oahu in Hawaii, I was brought to a sushi Nazi. In, in Sydney, Australia, I went to the pizza Nazi. And uh, somebody else turned me on to, uh, uh, to, to a Mexican Nazi, uh, taco Nazi. And anybody can become a Nazi. All you have to do is have a really good product. And the motto says, we're not happy till you're not happy, and you're a Nazi. <laughs> but, uh, but it's not a good idea to call him that. He is uh, Turkish, he, he's not a Nazi. But I changed his name, I refer to him as the Soup Rat Bastard. I think it's more politically <laughs> correct. Anyway, we're about to end up at our destination, at the uh, final destination here, where we started the tour. Couple of announcements to make. Uh, first of all, have a nice round of applause for Salman, who did a great job today, made a wonderful turn, got us there safely. Yeah, the With the great U turn, bus, he made like a great U turn. turn. But, uh, and also, that picture that I took will be up on the website. I go right upstairs, I put it up. When you get off the bus, I'm going to give you each a flyer that has my website address, which is simply kennykramer.com. When you get to kennykramer.com, you scroll down the page till you see the Kramart logo. Underneath the Kramart logo is a, a place that you can instant message me, and if I'm online, I'll instant message you right back. Underneath that is a line of hypertext that says, been on the tour looking for your photo, click here. You click on that, you get an archive of dates, you click on today's date, and the picture will load right up on your screen because I put up a very low resolution picture so people would dial up it'll load quickly. But if you'd like a copy of that picture to print as a souvenir, there's a line of hypertext that you click on that, it sends me an email, put today's date in the subject line, and I'll send you back the full size, high resolution copy of the picture. It's usually between one, one and a half and two megs. Um, I answer all my own emails, so if you write to me, you will hear back from me, I guarantee you, usually within 24 hours. Um, when you do leave the bus, please be sure to look under your seats and your overheads and your underheads. If you had a camera with you or something, please look in the fold of the seat that nothing slipped out of your pocket, and I don't want you to leave anything on the bus. I just want to take a moment and uh, thank you for being such a great group. Sit down, sit down for a second here. I, I want you to know that I had a lot of fun today and I think it's more important for me to have fun than you because if this thing stinks a few hours out of your life, there's no big deal, but then you know, I'd have to live with it. So hopefully you had a good time. When you get off the bus, I'm gonna, oh, incidentally, this Greek bakery here is probably one of the most famous, fantastic Greek bakeries in the whole world. They're friends of mine, and if you want to go in and get some baklava, I'm telling you, tell them Kramer sent you. But you're in for a treat, I swear to you, this is one of the greatest Greek bakeries in the whole world. It's been there for like the fourth generation already. And the only reason they can exist is they own the building. So. Uh, Anyway, when you get off the bus, I'm going to give you a fly. Oh, if you want to go to the comedy club, let me know and I'll give you passes. Each pass is good for two people. And uh, all you have to do is call and make a reservation. Tell them you're on the Kramer tour and they'll waive the $20 admission charge. And it's just a two drink minimum. If you're staying at a hotel, do me a favor and let me know and I'll give you some extra flyers that you can bring to the concierge at your hotel and tell them that you've just been on the greatest tour you've ever been on in your life, okay? If you don't feel that way about it, do me a personal favor, just keep your mouth shut. Okay? <laughs> you could be messing up a really good thing when I'm going here. Anyway, thanks for coming today, everybody. Get home safe. Thank you.